Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. Um, hi, thanks for the invitation. Um, so today I'll talk about um, an interesting geometry uh, based probing techniques to study the internal representations of these networks and potentially neural representations as well. Um, so the motivation for this work comes from invariant object recognition which refers to the brain's ability to distinguish between... I'm sorry, Suyun, can I, yeah. I, we actually don't see you on the camera. I don't know if it's gotten turned somehow, but... Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I think it, it looks like... Oh. Yeah. oh, you were just in, it was in your background. That's what it was. It decided you were, you were all background. Nice. But can you, can you now see me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, great. Perfect. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so the motivation comes from invariant object recognition and the fact that we're able to recognize um, objects despite the, the immense amount of variabilities that exist in the stimulus space, like size, um, orientation, or position, or background context. And um, in, uh, from the perspective of the neural population, this becomes the, the problem of object manifolds. So more specifically, if a set of neurons are responding to two different objects and uh, these neurons are tuned differently to these different types of objects, for example, a dog versus a cat, and they become two points in, the, in this high dimensional neural vector space. But as these objects have variabilities, they become two different object manifolds because these representations move around as the variabilities um, are introduced in the stimulus space. Now, in the feed-forward visual hierarchy, it's been suggested that this separation can arise by layers of nonlinear transformations to increase linear separability. This was first suggested um, in, in the paper by Jim DiCarlo and David Cox in 2007. And similar ideas have been suggested in deep network theories that object manifolds are untangled to become more linearly separable across the deep hierarchy. So untangling here refers to uh, reformatting manifolds or object manifolds across the layers to increase linear separability. And in, in this perspective, object recognition with stimulus variabilities amounts to positioning a decision hyperplane between two different object manifolds, which is determined by a direction vector W, uh, normal to the hyperplane, that is equivalent to the linear readout weight on the activity. Now, this leads to the question of how we can quantify and formalize the, the linear separability of object manifolds and, and their geometry. So to answer this, um, we developed a, a theory of um, manifold capacity, which is a generalization of a perceptron capacity, which is um, originally for discrete points, but now to object manifolds. It's a theoretical tool to assess the manifold representations in deep networks. Um, and this is a work that's done with um, Chaim Sompolinsky and Dan Lee. Now, let me let, so for the rest of the talk, uh, I'll, I'll talk first briefly about the theory um, and the summary of the theory and um, recent applications of this, um, this theory, which turns into a probing technique to visual and auditory and language deep networks. Now, before talking about the details of the theory, first I wanted to define what we mean by object manifolds mathematically or manifold-like object representations. Um, so let's say we're in n-dimensional ambient um, space. So that means we have n-dimensional features or n-dimensional units that we want to probe. And um, these object manifolds um, are defined by the different categories that we want to classify. And they occupy d-dimensional subspace and each point on, on an object manifold is, um, can be summarized as the sum of the center of the object manifold plus the linear sum of the basis vectors, where there are d of them, and the shape parameter s, 
and uh, the different types of optic manifolds can be determined or parameterized by the shape, the function of the shape parameter s. We're, we're considering p of the, the number, p for the number of manifolds or number of categories. So p, if p is 100, that means we're thinking, we're considering 100 different classes at like c par 100. Um, and these optic manifolds do not have to be smooth. Uh, I just have to emphasize that because the term manifold sometimes um, implies that there's, a, there's an implication in mathematics that here we're using it uh, more in the sense of there's a subspace that's occupying in the high dimensional space. So you can have point clouds or data clouds and, and the convex hull of the data cloud is what we call an optic manifold here. And in order to characterize the capacity, we make statistical assumptions about um, these manifolds, namely that the centers um, of these optic manifolds are randomly oriented and the subspaces of the optic manifolds are also random. And that's the initial set of results on the capacity. Um, although later on, we also take the correlations between um, these manifolds into account to, to apply on the real data. So I'll talk about that. Briefly. So uh, first, what do I mean by capacity of optic manifolds? So this, this is similar to the capacity, perceptron capacity, except where the counting units for the capacity is now in terms of the class manifolds. So um, if, you, if you're, the object manifolds have roughly this kind of geometry, and if you have a few number of categories, then it's easy to separate them. But as you put in more and more of object manifolds, the, the possible linear separating solution under the um, uh, binary dichotomy classification reduces. Um, you have fewer solutions. And after some point, it becomes hard to separate them on average. So the point where you can't find a linear separable, linearly separating solution, that's what we define as a capacity of object manifolds. Um, so the critical, so that's what we mean by manifold capacity, manifold classification capacity, that is the maximum load, which is P over N, where P is the number of linearly classifiable categories or object manifolds divided by n, where n is an ambient dimension, um, where most of these di dichotomies of the manifolds are linearly separable. Now, the next question for the theory is how the geometry of these object manifolds are related to manifold capacity. And to do this, uh, we use the tool um, from statistical mechanics to compute the, the volume of the solution. So here is a similar picture where um, we're separating between uh, different spheres and you can see that the space of solutions, uh, linearly separating solutions are high, but um, it becomes smaller as you have more manifolds and it becomes, uh, the volume of solution becomes zero as you, as you approach the critical capacity. And to compute the capacity, what you have to do is to uh, explicitly write down the the volume of the solution um, as, a, as a function of the geometry of an object manifold. To, uh, and to do this, we, we uh, borrow the tool from StatMet called replica trick. Now, what's different from the previous theory on the points is that um, when, when you ex express the, the, the expression for the volume of the solution, um, what goes into this term um, that counts the qualifying um, region in the in the volume in, in the space of solutions is previously for the discrete points it was the the distance between the discrete point and the separating hyperplane but as we are considering object manifold we um, express the worst point or the point that's closest to the hyperplane on, on a specific manifold. And it, it, tur it turns out that this technique allows you to express the, the, the manifold for manifold capacity for um, general, uh, general shaped object manifolds 
um, as a function of um, the, the size of an object manifold and the dimension of an object manifold and then impose the margin for the linear separation. So, um, and, and then, so it, it's, uh, and here I, I'm showing the summary of the theory that is for a general shaped manifold, the capacity, which is um, often referred as to as an alpha, can be written in terms of the capacity of an L2 ball, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, where the radius and dimension um, of of the of the of the general shaped manifold can can be defined for for the for the general shaped manifold. Um, so before talking about the general general shaped manifold, I should also emphasize that for the spherical shapes or L2 balls, um, you can also you can actually analytically write down the capacity for L2 balls as a function of um, radius and dimension of the spheres or L2 balls with the imposed margin and it's a pretty crisp form and you can get a pretty good intuition about the relationship between the object manifold capacity and the radius and the dimension of these each one of these object manifolds and what we're seeing here is um, the theoretical prediction um, which is a line here matching the simulation capacities oh, i should also mention that this object manifold capacity can be also um, measured empirically by simply assigning random labels to each manifolds and uh, reducing or, or increasing the feature dimension and finding the critical dimension where where the fraction of the, the linear separating solution is roughly percent so um so the so the markers that you see here are the ground truth or simulation capacity and the line here is a theoretical capacity and what you see here is that um, if you fix the radius of the L2 balls the same, then um, at, as you increase the dimension of the L2 balls, the capacity reduces. So the higher dimensional optic manifolds are harder to separate. That's generally what we're seeing here. Uh, what we're seeing on the right-hand side of the figure is as you increase the radius of a of an object manifold, the capacity also reduces. So um, if you want to have a higher object manifold capacity, you need to lower the object manifold dimension and object manifold radius. And, and then the, what we're seeing in this particular slide is a result from um, simple um, spherical L2 shaped balls. Um, now, so, so, so what I think what I should also emphasize that, so using the results that we get from the L2 ball um, theory, what we can then do is to generalize the, the expression for the, um, the capacity of general, uh, general shaped manifolds and the form of the general manifold capacity actually turns out to be very similar to the capacity for L2 ball. Then that actually allows you to define um, the measure for the radius and dimension of an arbitrarily shaped object manifold. And um, without going into the, too much of a detail for, for the time constraint, I, what I wanted to mention is that the, um, the, the radius and dimension of these object manifolds are determined by what we call anchor points um, on, on an object manifold. And they're basically, um, like uh, the the points that are representative for the linear linear classification, so similar to support vectors, um, but since we are considering object manifolds, um, the, the, we could have uh, the entire subspace of anchor points, for example. Um, so, and then um, the the object radius and object dimension properties, it, so they, they basically capture the statistics of these anchor points in, in terms of their size and the dimensions that are observed by the linear linear classifying hyperplane. So, um, and then, and so far, this was the, um, the theory that 
um, captures the, the capacity for L2 spherical balls and the general shape manifolds in random positions. Um, but in reality, the data also has the correlations. So uh, recently we took the correlations between the data into account. And uh, what we find is that the correlations between the centers of these objects tend to reduce the capacity and they're often low rank. And uh, this can be basically take, uh, taken into account for the theory. <clears throat> and for, for the rest of the, the talk, I will refer to, uh, I will talk about the, uh, the, uh, the center correlation. So, uh, yeah, the center correlation that I will refer to is basically the average of the pairwise overlap between the, the manifold centers. And the summary of the theory basically comes down to uh, four of these properties. And this is basically all you need to remember for, to understand the rest of the, the talk that is more exciting uh, on applications. Um, but yeah, first the manifold capacity, which is a measure for um, how many object manifolds you can linearly classify per feature dimension, such that the manifold dichotomies are linearly separable. Um, and this captures the linear separability of object manifolds, or you could also think of it as a storage capacity of um, not patterns, but object classes. So how many, how much of an object, uh, variable object information is encoded in the, in the distributed representation. So that's the manifold capacity. Um, and manifold dimension and manifold radius. Uh, and the correlations between the locations of these object manifolds. Um, and when, when, what, so these four properties are theoretically linked in such a way that the capacity can be predicted by the geometrical properties of these object manifolds. And they're related in such a way that um, when you're in a highly tangled and bad representation, the capacity is low and that tends to be um, correlated with the uh, larger object manifold dimension and larger object uh, manifold radius and higher correlations. And if you want to drive the representation to be highly untangled and separated, you need to reduce these three properties. So uh, this is basically the, the summary of the theory. And without uh, more glory for details, we'll, uh, we'll go to the applications. First, um, uh, we'll talk about the how object manifolds emerge in the, in the visual deep networks. So um, we use an image net to define two different types of object manifolds. One is a, a point cloud manifold where um, object manifolds correspond to the different classes in, in ImageNet and the, the, the points or vectors within the, the object manifold are different examples. Um, another object manifold that we define is a fine transformation manifold, which is starting with one image and you, you um, apply a fine transformations um, to get a smooth and small manifold and it's kind of reflective of the data augmentations that you do on a, on a deep net. And then you run these images on um, conventional CNN and you can extract the features from every layer of the network and um, start analyzing it with this metric. So first, um, before going to the geometry, I wanted to also mention that um, the theoretical capacity that we get from this replica theory um, matches the empirical manifold capacity pretty well. So that's that's one thing that we want to just show it. Um, and you can then see how the manifold capacities are um, changing across the layers of these uh, deep network. And so here it's an AlexNet. And you can see that they, they improve across the layers of the deep network representations um, so left is point cloud manifold and right is smooth manifold and they both um, prove. Um, and this is probably quite similar to what you would get if you just train a linear classifier on top of uh, the deep net and then try to get a 
um, the accuracy, like, it, like you know, it's known as a linear probing method. But um, what we can do with this metric now is ask the question of why these manifold capacities are improving across layers. And now we can ask, uh, answer that question by looking at the geometrical property. So this is a manifold capacity improving across layers that we saw and can now tell that this is because the dimensionalities of these optic manifolds are <clears throat> reducing as well as the manifold radius and the center correlations between the optic manifolds. Now, uh, uh, there are a lot of repeating motifs in within these conventional deep nets. Um, here, looking at AlexNet, but you can find a similar motif in VGC16. Um, and then you can start to analyze what is an effect of each um, network motif or the nonlinearities that are used a lot um, on, on the geometry of these object manifolds. And what you can see is that um, this, this is, um, yeah, this is an analysis on the pre-trained network. And, um, and then on all of the ReLU layers and then before and after. So that's why we're showing the delta. So this is a change in the object dimension change in the object radius and a change in center correlations and if, if, if you if you want to go to the direction where you're improving the object capacity object manifold capacity you basically want to reduce all, all of these properties and so you want to be in the negative quadrant um, but what we're seeing is that after a single layer of relu um, there's a trade-off so it's reducing the correlation but it's increasing the dimension um, here also, um, yeah, this is, yeah, maybe here in the max cooling layer, this, uh, is decreasing the dimensionality and radius, but it's increasing correlation. There seems to be some trade-off between these properties, but when you combine these layers together, um, the, the, the function of the, of the, of the, the, this clusters of the layers um, become um, here in the sense that um, the effect of these these motifs are such that they they're in the negative quadrant. Um, but overall, what we're seeing here is that um, when you know there, there's there's typically some um, trade-off when when you just focus on one layer. When you combine them, um, the representations change in such a way that it, it improves manifold capacity. Um, this metric is not just for a deep net, so you can also use it to analyze the neural representations. Um, so here we're using the neural activities from um, V4 and IT regions of the macaque monkey, and you can see that the manifold capacities are also improving across the ventral stream hierarchy, and that's um, and you also see that there's a reduction in the dimension and radius of these object manifolds. Um, we can also analyze how how these properties, how this untangling happens over the course of the time. Um, so you, you can use this task relevant geometrical tool um, as a measure for characterizing high dimensional neural population and use it to compare the representations between the, the, the monkey neural data with the deep network. Well, this is an ongoing work. Um, now, I'll uh, quickly go over the applications in uh, other modalities. So, the, so this, this metric doesn't, it, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't care about the modalities. So you can apply it on any representations that have uh, well-defined categories. So what uh, we went ahead and um, did was to take the, the conventional um, speech recognition models, uh, which is a deep recurrent network. Um, where the input is coming in the form of a sequence of spectrograms and uh, it, uh, the network basically transcribes the, the text. But here you can also define um, word manifolds, for example, because um, the this speech, deep speech network is hearing a spoken language and it transcribes the text and it's done and then you can 
you, you can define the words on, on in different contexts and spoken by different speakers. And what we find is that there's very similar untangling um, observed in the speech recognition network. So you can see that the word manifolds are um, emerging across the layers of the deep net. And I should mention that this is a network that's not explicitly trained to recognize words. It's a transcription network, but you can you can see that there, there's an emergence of object information of words. Um, and uh, it, how that's related to the geometry seems to be also very similar to vision. So that's the emergence of capacity seems to be due to the reduction in, in radius and dimension and set of correlations. Um, interestingly, you can also probe the manifolds defined by phonemes and part of speech. They also seem to emerge in, in the same network as well. Um, and you can you can see the the role of recurrence by analyzing the emergence of manifold capacity across time steps, which you can see by doing a dimensionality reduction technique. These are the uh, different words, and then you can see that they separate and come back over the course of the time. Uh, but this metric allows you to quantify how they, they emerge um, and, and also across different layers. Um, and then this is, um, and um, lastly, similarly, you can also use this technique to probe the internal representations of the, the language model. So here is our um, first attempt at um, doing a proof of concept kind of work on, on um, probing how um, language manifolds might emerge in a transformer networks where um, yeah initially the networks are math uh, so sorry the, the input sequence has some the mask data uh, and the network is trained to predict the, um, the token that's been masked and you can you can see that across the course of the layers of the transformer architecture um, hierarchy there, there's an emergence of um, uh, a lot of interesting linguistical object manifolds observed by the capacity. Uh, what's interesting is that there is one l linguistical tag that doesn't seem to emerge, which is dependency depth. And that's this is very specific to syntax. Um, and it, it seems that this is an interesting result because the linguistical tags that, that are defined by the categories, they all seem to be uh, emerging across the layers. But the tag that has um, uh, transit, uh, transitive information like the depth of a, a tree, that doesn't actually seem to emerge. Um, and it, it probably is because the capacity manifolds are about classifications and it doesn't really capture the relative numbers in the tags. In any case, um, this improvement in the capacity is due to the uh, um, similar kind of reduction in radius and then reduction in the dimensionalities, except for the dependency depth and then reduction in the center correlations. So we can also use this technique to um, probe the internal representations of language models, which is somewhat interesting. And it's coming out in ICML soon. So to summarize, um, we generalize the step MAC theory of linear classification of points to that of general randomly oriented manifolds. Um, and the capacity of uh, category manifolds measures the invariant object information and features um, and this is predicted by the effective size, radius, dimensionality, and correlation structure of these uh, perceptual manifolds. And we've shown that you could use this in the vision and speech and language models, but there's also a lot of um, um, exciting future applications and perhaps probing learning dynamics, um, checking the untangling in motor motifs or other sensory modalities. So there's a lot of exciting future work. Um, and then thank my collaborators and mentors, especially Heim Sumpolinski and Dan Lee and Uri Cohen. Great. That's the end of my talk. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I, I know I have many questions, but unfortunately, I think uh, due to time, we're going to have to take those on Slack. So uh, if you do have questions, you can just post those um, on Slack.